Some call it a nostalgic series. Others call it a kid series. But I call it a sensational series. Pokemon, Pokemon, Pokemon. What can I say about this series that hasn't already been said? It's one of gaming's greatest icons, one of the best selling franchises ever, and without a doubt, my favorite video game franchise. And to celebrate Pokemon's 20th anniversary, I'm doing something big. I'm not just going to talk about my top 10 favorite Pokemon, or even my top 20. No. I'm going the extra mile and talking about my top 50 favorite Pokemon. Now I have to set some rules. For a Pokemon to qualify for this list, I would have to have raced it at least once or have used it on a team in general. I'm judging these Pokemon based on their design, their battling capabilities and potential, and even some special meaning these Pokemon might have to me. And a big rule, no major legendaries. I love them a lot, and they're all really good, so much so that Lugia, Kyogre, Rayquaza, Dialga, Giratina, Zekrom, Kyurem, and Xerneas would all rank really high, and this gives the opportunity to include Pokemon that wouldn't be on my list otherwise. And I'm not doing this list alone. A bunch of my friends and others who auditioned are going to be a part of this endeavor too. Now it's time to stop stalling and finally talk about my top 50 favorite Pokemon. Let's roll! Oh, Pokemon Emerald, how I love you so. This was the game to get me into the series, and it still holds a very special place in my heart as my most nostalgic game ever. I still fondly remember the very first team I ever raised, and the Pokemon to kick off this list is the first Pokemon I ever caught, Mighty Anna. Oh man, the nostalgia. Let's start with this design. Mighty Anna has a simple yet effective design, obviously being based off a hyena with some influence from wolves. In battle, it's... Okay, I'll admit, Mighty Anna isn't that great in battle. It's snaps are below average, and its attack stats only at an okay 90. Its move pool is also a bit lacking, but it does have some nice moves like Crunch, Takedown, Sucker Punch, and even some interesting egg moves like the Elemental Fangs and even Play Rough. However, Mighty Anna does have some uses in battle. For one, it's a mono dark type, giving it a handy immunity to Psychic and only two or three weaknesses depending on the generation. Also, it has the Intimidate ability, meaning it cuts the opponent's attack when it's sent out, possibly giving you an edge. But like I said, I have a great deal of nostalgia with Mighty Anna. When I first saw Poochyanna, I knew I wanted to catch it, and Mighty Anna actually did serve me well. Intimidate really came in handy, and against Tate and Liza, he was my go-to. So yeah, not too great in battle, but with an effective design and nostalgic memories, Mighty Anna is a choice contender to start this list. Oh man, it's so cute! Uh, do I lose any main Linux points for calling Lopunny cute? Eh, who cares. Nevertheless, next up is Lopunny. Design-wise, it's absolutely adorable, and the design works well. But once again, we come to a Pokemon that's kind of lackluster in battle, but does a bit better than Mighty Anna. First off, this bunny is fast, with an impressive speed stat of 105, and being a normal type, it has quite a few options for moves. From a turn, the elemental punches, and even switch your to work in tangent with its klutz ability. Using this tactic, you can cripple an opponent with harmful items like the Flame Orb, a Toxic Orb, or an Iron Ball. For story playthroughs, however, I prefer Cute Charm because it can screw over an opponent easily. However, Lopunny didn't really see too much use until Oros came around when it was blessed with a Mega Evolution and OH MAN, THIS THING IS POWERFUL! It has 30 points added to its already impressive speed as its attack stat buff to 136! It also gains a secondary fighting type and a scrappy ability, which means its normal and fighting type moves can actually hit ghost types, making it even harder to wall. And by running moves like Fake Out, Return, and Jump Kick, you have a very terrifying bunny that any competitive team should plan for. This adorable Pokemon jumps right into the number 49 spot with its cute design and absolutely fantastic mega evolution. Winning with this cutie makes you want to jump for joy. You can learn a lot about a Pokemon by raising it for the first time. On my latest playthrough of Emerald, I decided to raise three Pokemon I hadn't raised before. There was Waylord, which honestly didn't impress me that much, but the other two did impress me, and the first of those two is right here, Maynectric. With its sweet design, it looks fierce, and it certainly is in bow. With a great speed stat and equally good special attack, this beast is designed to hit fast and hit hard. However, its move pool is lacking. Aside from your trademark electric attacks like Thunderbolt and Discharge, it doesn't have much. It does get Flamethrower and Overheat, which is alright, but I just wish it had more. 
Not to say Mana Trick didn't serve me well in that playthrough, because it certainly did. Having Static and Thunder Wave to paralyze opponents gave me a huge advantage in many battles, and his high special attack stat let him hit really hard. But like Lopunny, Manetric was also given a Mega Evolution in 6th Gen. Its Mega Evolution gives 30 more points to its already great special attack and speed, and 20 to each of its defenses. On top of that, it gets the Intimidated ability, and I already explained how great that is. Pair this ability with the move Volt Switch, and you have one of the best team pivots you can ask for, dealing damage and then switching out to use Intimidate later. And on this insane speed and special attack, it's a great asset. If you're not prepared, he'll take you out lightning fast! And here's the second home Pokemon to impress me on that run, Armaldo. When it comes to fossil Pokemon, Armaldo definitely stands out. Its design, based off an ancient sea-dwelling arthropod, looks rather unique, and I've always liked it. In battle, Armaldo functions very well as a tank, with its great base 125 attack stat and base 100 defense. Its typing and ability help it in this regard. Defensively, Rock and Bug work decently together, giving it only 3 weaknesses to Rock, Steel, and Water, and its main ability, Battle Armor, completely negates critical hits, which is a huge asset. Of course, nowadays, you can also use its hidden ability Swift Swim to help its pretty low speed, although this is risky, given its water weakness. But like I said, this ancient Pokemon impressed me when I had decided to raise it in Emerald. It was a little tough starting out, yeah, but once it got going, Anorith was great at tanking hits and dealing hits back, and once it evolved, it became a very solid member of my team. This Pokemon certainly brings power from the prehistoric times, and it's a great Pokemon to raise. They say it lurks in the shadows, waiting to strike. It's said that if it's in the vicinity, you will literally feel a chill run down your spine. It's always been one of the most terrifying special sweepers ever, Gengar. And at a completely shift tone, Gengar is a pretty sweet Pokemon. Like most Gen 1 Pokemon, it's a really simple design, but you may notice it bears resemblance to Clefable. And also, Gengar's name is partially derived from Doppelganger, meaning a double. Yeah, this was most likely done deliberately. Moving on from creepy implications, this thing is a horror in battle. With solid typing both offensively and defensively, especially in the current gen, the awesome levitate ability and fantastic speed and special attack it has definitely earned its place among the best special sweepers in the series. Helping it out is its fantastic move pool, with moves such as Shadow Ball, Sludge Bomb, Psychic, Energy Ball, Focus Blast, and Thunderbolt, among others. But then Game Freak came along and said, hmm, I don't think this really fast and strong Pokemon is good enough. Let's give it even more power! As a result, Gengar got a mega evolution, and it's terrifying! It gains even more power and speed, as well as a bit of bulk to help it tank a hit or two. It may lose Levitate, which gives it an additional weakness to ground that normal Gengar is immune to, but in exchange, it gets the Shadow Tag ability, which traps the opponent unless they're a Ghost type or have Shadow Tag themselves. Pair that with Destiny Bone, and your opponent is pretty much guaranteed to lose at least one Pokemon to this Ghost. So why is it so low? Well, I haven't raised one since Diamond, and I never really used it on a competitive team. Nevertheless, set this Pokemon up right, and your opponent won't stand a Ghost of a Chance. Moving on from a terrifying ghost to a terrifying hound based off the Cerberus, Houndoom. Now I'm probably going to get some strange looks for putting Houndoom over Gengar, but please hear me out. First off, I find Houndoom's design to be way more interesting. I mean, he's based off the Cerberus and he looks awesome. Plus, any relation to any sort of mythology will earn bonus points from me. In battle, Houndoom can be pretty fierce. Dark and Fire complement each other really nicely, giving its stab combo good versatility. However, defensively, it's not as good, having four weaknesses, but also having some useful resistances and a psychic immunity. However, he does get the Flash Fire, which grants total immunity to fire type moves and powers up its own fire type moves if tipped by one, making it a great switch in. As for moves, it doesn't have much. Having trademark fire and dark type moves such as Flamethrower and Dark Pulse, but also some interesting options like Sludge Bomb and Solar Beam, and when you pair it with its great offenses and speed, it can hit hard. Houndoom also has a Mega Evolution, which is. okay. Don't get me wrong, it gets a nice boost to its special attack and speed, as well as more bulk, but it's outclassed due to its shallow move pool, and that Mega Houndoom gets solar power as its ability, which is honestly lackluster. Although Mega Houndoom looks absolutely terrifying, and that's awesome. And let me tell you, on one of my playthroughs of Pokemon XD, I decided to use the Hound Harry get fairly early on, and it served me well. Having a good speed set and awesome special attack, it did great, and made using Sunny Day on my team a fantastic idea. And then I decided to raise one in Platinum, and it served me even better there, given it had better move options. Awesome design and great uses in battle, Houndoom has certainly earned this spot. Hello and welcome to Guess That Pokemon with your host, Xehanort. I'm going to give you three clues about one Pokemon and you guess what that Pokemon is. Are you ready? It's a water ground type, in the never used tier, and lastly, it's usually physically defensive. If you guessed Quagsire, then you are absolutely correct! 
let's start with this design. It's based off of a giant salamander, right down to the dirt face. As I said before, Quagsire is in the A- rank of NU, along with Auroras, Cacturn, Grottum, Swallow, and Weezing. So, as you can see, Quagsire is definitely a force to be reckoned with, and there are two reasons for that. It has a dual type of ground and water, giving it only a 4 times weakness to grass. The second and the bigger reason is its ability. Unaware negates any stat boosts and debuffs on other Pokémon. Any Pokémon that requires any setup is basically dead. Yes, Clefable also has this ability, but Quagsire has the advantage of its typing. Quagsire is usually a wall due to his HP complementing his average defense, and it can learn recover. It does have low special stats and low speed, meaning that if the opponent has a powerful enough special attack, you're going to have a hard time surviving the onslaught. However, in the right hands and in the right situation, Quagsire can wall almost anything in NU. Also, just look at that face. That is the face of a thing that has seen horrible, horrible things. Let's talk some more Pokemon, shall we? As some of you know, I, are, I started Pokemon with Generation 2 with Crystal. Then, a few months later, I tried Gen 1 with Yellow. Those were some great times, a great childhood spend with my salmon-colored Game Boy Color playing Pokemon all the time with my friends. Ah, memories. But then... I kinda stopped. Unfortunately, I was caught in that vicious cycle of Pokemon is for kids and you shouldn't play that. And you know, bullying was a big deal at the time. I didn't want to get bullied more than I already did for just for playing Pokemon. So, I pretty much stopped playing when Ruby and Sapphire came along. No more Pokemon games would be played for more than five years of my life. Oh boy. And then Gen 4, Gen 4 came out. A friend of mine was playing Pokemon Diamond back at the camping site we used to go a few years back. At first he talked to me about it, and I literally just responded, The fuck's an Infernape? <sighs> I just, I'm still ashamed to this day of that little answer of mine. It's like someone responding, What the fuck is a Sonic? It's my kind of embarrassment. Uh, but anyway, this, this little embarrassment aside, uh, Pokemon Platinum came out just after, and I was like, okay, I I'll guess I'll give it a shot. And the most important moment of a trainer's life came back in my eyes. Who do I choose to accompany me on my journey in this undiscovered land that is the Sinnoh region? After looking at, looking at all three starters, my mind was made up. I chose... Chimcha Piplup! I chose Piplup. I never regretted that choice when it evolved. <laughs> Empoleon. Where do I even begin with you? Just your name! Empoleon! It sounds so... so badass and royal, you know? I loved it! Second of all, its new added steel type is a welcoming feature to me. After all, steel is one of my favorite types. And with this type, Empoleon is an excellent typing with key resistances to flying, now with fairy, dragon, and psychic type moves, and a natural bulk to complement these. Empoleon is a pretty defensive Pokémon with a high special attack to back it up, with some good utility moves like Stealth Rock, Defog, and Roar. So that means it can be viable for both a supportive and offensive, offensive role. Empoleon has an, has an extremely good tide coverage as well, with moves like Scald, Grass Knot, Ice Beam, Drill Peck, Flash Cannon, Earthquake, Brick Break, Shadow Claw, Rock Slide, and Signal Beam, with some Pretty weak dark type attack moves, but that gives him 11 out of the 18 types to play with. That's a lot of coverage. Empoleon is very special to me because it's the one Pokemon that got me back in the franchise after so many years in the dark and made me the huge Pokemaniac I am today. So, thanks, buddy! The 
Pokemon selection in Colosseum was very limited, only allowing you to catch 50 Pokemon to use. This is bittersweet. On one hand, it made the game much harder, especially given how much of a pain purifying Pokemon was. On the other hand, it did give me the chance to raise some Pokemon I never thought of raising. When I played through Colosseum, I raised two new Pokemon, the first of which, Fortress. When it comes to solid walls, Fortress is pretty much second to none. Its design says it all. Being a bag room shaped like a walnut, it's meant to be a wall. And oh man, it does this job well. Being a bug and steel type, it only has one weakness, plus a handy immunity to the ever common toxic. Now, although its one weakness is a four times weakness, it has a sturdy ability, meaning it will always tank at least one hit. But without a fire type move, good luck trying to do any decent damage to this thing. On top of its fantastic defensive typing, it also has a fantastic defense stat of 140 and a decent base 75 HP stat. Its special defense is a bit weak, though, but eh, what can you do? As for moves, it has surprising diversity. From all three entry hazard moves to Toxic and other options like Thunder Wave, Reflect, and Light Screen, and even Explosion to send it off with a bang! Fortress has always been one of the best walls ever since its introduction, and served me very well in Colosseum. It had a hidden power of both, giving it a solid stab move, and since it was before Explosion's nerf, I was able to take out tough opponents by having Fortress explode while a teammate protected itself. How do you think I took down Evis so easily at a huge level disadvantage? Yep, Fortress has no problem defending its spawn on this list. Whenever a new Pokemon game has come out, I've always been drawn to the Water Star for whatever reason. Maybe it's because blue is my favorite color, or because water types are freaking awesome, but the Water Star from each region is more often than not my favorite, and Johto is no exception. For Alligator, it's awesome. Its design is pretty simple, yeah, but it looks both cool and ferocious at the same time. As a water type in battle, for Alligator is above average. Having a great attack stat of 105 and surprisingly good base 100 defense, it's pretty good as a physical sweeper slash tank. As for moves, it has the ever classic Surf and Hydro Pump, but also options like Waterfall, Crunch, Ice Fang, Dragon Claw, and even Aqua Jet to offset its below average speed, and Dragon Sand to step up its speed and attack at the same time. However, you never shine too well on the competitive scene. That is, until Game Freak finally gave us its hidden ability, Sheer Force. With this ability, any move with a secondary effect will have its power boosted by 30% at the expense of losing that move's secondary effect. What this means is moves like Waterfall and Crunch become much stronger, and since Sheer Force also negates recoil from a Life Orb, this Gator has become pretty terrifying. Even without that trait, Feral Gator served me well on multiple playthroughs of Soul Silver, dishing out powerful attacks and watching the opponent fall. Sheer Ferocity and Solid in Battle, Feral Gator certainly earns this spot. <laughs> 